Good morning and welcome audience to an engaging conversation with Anjali Arundekar. She is a professor of feminist studies and founding co-director Center for South Asian Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So I came to know about Anjali after watching an insightful and engaging dialogue with Mr. Rahul Gandhi during his recent U.S. Uh, visit. So uh, there I saw her making him speak on all issues concerning challenges that Indians have been facing for some time and uh, that we all Indians have been wishing to be addressed speedily. So welcome Anjali ji. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with the MOOC Nayak today. And I'm really excited to learn more about your work and uh, experiences on the gender studies in South Asia. Jai Bheem to everybody. And thank you for inviting me to this platform. MOOC Nayak has become a very important news platform for many of us, both in the diaspora and in India. So I am very grateful for the work you do, and I look forward to this conversation. Yeah. Uh, so Anjali ji, as a Bahujan and a queer scholar yourself, we are uh, eager to know about your experiences that has shaped your work. So could you tell us something about your formative years in India? Yes, of course. So first and foremost, as I was saying to you previously, I grew up in Maharashtra, in, in Mumbai. I am from a Devadasi Kalavant community, the Gomantak Maratha Samaj. My grandmothers were Devadasis. My mother and father are the first to be legally married. So I grew up in a very robustly caste conscious Samaj where we were... Um, invited to be very proud of our history and to use our history for social reform mm -hmm. and progress. Now, the Gomantak Maratha Samaj is a Bahuzan Samaj, but Maratha is a word that, of course, now is attached to uh, Bahujans who oppress other Bahujans in Dalits. But Maratha, as the term was coined uh, during the formation of the Gomantak Maratha Samaj, was a way to unify Devadasi communities in Western India, in Portuguese India, and in British India. As many of your listeners may know, we know a lot about Devadasis in Southern India, but not so much about Devadasis. In yeah. Exactly. And for example, we do not know that most of Hindustani classical music and most of Hindi music was sung, composed, and, and delivered by Devadasis, particularly from the Gomantak Mahara so much like, of course, the Ooh. famous Mangeshkar sisters like Lata Mangeshkar, Asha Bhosle, Kishori Amonkar, Arti Anklikar. So many of these histories are histories of music, but very few people talk about Devadasi's past. And my work has been um, a sort of a way to engage with that history and also to use that history to do more progressive work with other communities, uh, minority communities of caste and sexuality. Okay. So could you tell us something interesting about many recent studies you have made? Any startling? Well, uh, the, sorry, go ahead. One of the most interesting things about working on histories of caste and sexuality, and the good news is there are many wonderful Dalit Bahujan feminist scholars who are working on this. My, my uh, friend Shaila Jappaik, who has written a wonderful book on the vulgarity of caste, and also our ally, Sharmila Rege, who passed away too early, but was a Brahmin ally who did a lot of this work. One of the most interesting things about working on caste and sexuality is that the assumption that we often get from mainstream culture is there's no history. There are no archives. These stories have not been told. They have been disappeared. They've been erased. And one of the things that I have found and uh, the book that I have just finished, which will be out in August called Abundance, is that in yeah. fact there are lots of histories very robust complicated joyful histories that we simply have not been aware of or are not interested in because we are so used to thinking of histories of caste and sexuality as full of um, injury or disempowerment or lack of joy and my sort of goal in my intellectual, political, and, and in all parts of my life has been to embrace the efflorescence and joy of caste and sexuality. So one of the things that uh, I, I try to write about is what would it mean to think about histories of caste and sexuality as histories of plenitude, 
of abundance okay. instead of loss or vulnerability, because that is how we are always taught to think about. After all, the word bahujan was invoked to invoke the power of the bahu, the power of the majority. And I want to think about that also as an intellectual practice. What would it mean to speak from a place of empowerment rather than a place of disempowerment? Okay, okay. So Anjali ji, could you tell us uh, how these feminist studies can be used to address social justices, especially those concerning in India? Well, I mean, one of the most obvious ways is that most of the people working on questions of domestic violence, caste segregation, uh, sexual minoritization, um, urban planning, uh, environmental sustenance, all of these questions have come out from the work of feminists uh, who have been doing solidarity work across regions and caste. My mother, who is uh, a very, or was, she just recently passed away, was a very ordinary person, but extraordinary in that she did so much coalition work across caste and class practices. She worked with domestic workers fighting against sexual violence. She worked with the sweeper community in our neighborhood to involve women who were sweepers and how to protect them from the, the kind of advances of customers and clients who would bring them into their house to clean their garbage and, in, and then expose them to sexual violence. So I think feminism is very central to social reform and, and caste oppression. One of the challenges has been that caste and, and sexuality in the past, particularly in mainstream Indian feminism, have been ignored for the most part. But I think the most exciting thing about the last three, four decades is that feminists across India understand that feminism is multilingual. Mane bhot bhashao mein hota hai, Marathi mein, Hindi mein, Tamil mein, Kannada mein. Or all of these languages create different histories of feminists. So when you say caste, caste in Goa is very different from caste in Maharashtra. True, caste true. in yeah. Tamil Nadu is very different from caste in Kerala. Sexuality is also very different. So when you say homosexuality, it doesn't mean the same thing across different regions. So I think one of the, yeah. the most exciting things we are seeing now, and I think this is where we have to thank Hindutva. The only thing we have to thank Hindutva for is that it has created alliances between communities that would not normally have worked together. But the violence of Hindutva is so aggressive and so... Um, so all encompassing that we are now seeing coalitions we happen. Several organizations under one umbrella. Yeah, exactly right. And I think, for yeah. example, during the pandemic, we saw this a lot. I worked with a lot of organizations in Maharashtra that were Dalit Bahujan organizations, which were reaching out to central Maharashtra, places like Latur or places like Nanded, where we are seeing all the violence yeah. going on. Yeah. And they work together with LGBTI organizations in urban areas to get food, water supply, et cetera, across to multiple regions. We had not seen this happen before. And I think okay. it's because LGBT, trans, uh, queer communities were also being uh, ostracized during the pandemic, either by their families, et cetera. And many of them were either sex workers, were Dalit Bahujan. So there was a lot of convergence, which has always been there. Um, you know, I have been a feminist and a Bahujan at the same time. The two things are not separate for me. So I think in some ways, you know, Narendra Modi's terror, his reign of terror, his anti-caste, anti-feminist, anti-Muslim stance is so dramatically horrible that I think people are realizing that we have to work together. We can't true, do syncretion politics anymore. We have to come together in, in a kind of different way than we have before. True, the adversities and calamities sometimes do good also. So in this case, many oh, Mahujan oh. organizations are coming. Yeah, uh, okay. So since you have shared Modi ji, and Modi ji has reached you to Modi ji, so uh, just tell me, Anjali, how do you feel that from being denied the visa in 2005, how drastically Modi ji's popularity has changed and um, so much has been uh, talked about in the social media and the main media also about a new era in the US-India uh, friendship. So do you think, 
आपका सवाल बहुत कठिन है और आसान है मैं आसान वाला पहले बताती हूँ आपको आसान ये बात है कि मोदी जी की पॉपुलैरिटी बड़ी नहीं है कमी नहीं हुई इट्स द सेम 2005 में आई वाज वन ऑफ दोज पीपल इन्वॉल्व इन मेकिंग श्योर ही डिड नॉट गेट द वीजा हिज वीजा वाज डिनाइड बिकॉज ऑफ द वायोलेशन ऑफ रिलीजियस फ्रीडम्स देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ प्रोटेस्ट वेयर देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ सपोर्ट फॉर नरेंद्र मोदी एट द सेम टाइम एज देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ डिसेंट it is the same thing now what we see in the media right now is simply the us india prosperity story the growth story what we are not seeing and you can see it if you are on social media is the extensive amount of dissent and protest that are happening at the same time just yesterday 75 lawmakers from biden's party democrats who are senators and um uh, people who are um working at other levels of government have written a strongly worded letter of protest to biden asking him to involve questions of human rights violations in the visit with narendra modi oh, so on the one hand okay. yes narendra modi ki popularity zarur you know as Very we are told okay. over and over rock star hai lekin unka yeah. rock star reputation mein bahut sare holes hai and they have always been there and i think what it, it what we are seeing now is more of an accountability kamla harris who is narend who is biden's she, she uh, was very vocal president. yeah yeah yes and i have been you know i have written about that in the past so the good news about media is that we have records kamla harris was very critical of narendra modi's violation of human rights she will probably not say anything now because aapko malum hai ye visit is about yeah. ukraine is about defense it's about trade but mm-hmm. there is a lot of awareness about human rights violations uh, and we have the bbc to thank for it as well wo bbc ki documentary jab prasiddha ho gayi when it came out and then it was banned and the the protests the trade the raids against the uh, bbc uh, offices in delhi all of this has become part of the story So yes Narendra Modi is being very welcomed but he's also being very criticized across the board by politicians by human rights activists by people in the diaspora your audience needs to understand there are 5.4 million Indians who live in the United States 80% of those 5.4 million Indians are Hindus now for most of those people in the diaspora narendra modi's vision of a hindu rashtra makes them think that if they are to criticize narendra modi they are being hindu phobic which of course we know is complete nonsense hinduism any religion buddhism are not about division they are about solidarity so now we have organizations called hindus for human rights who are reminding people in the diaspora that hinduism is not hindutva so all of this is happening we also have caste discrimination which is being included as a category of protection in the state of california which i live in which is requiring the diaspora to understand the legacy of hindutva so i i i see it as a positive uh, awakening of the diaspora even though i doubt it will have an immediate impact in the 2024 elections but it will definitely have an impact along the road and we have seen that in karnataka which was a big deal given yeah, everything that is going on aur aage dekhte hain madhya pradesh rajasthan mein kya hota hai ji ji aapne indian diaspora ki baat ki caste discrimination jo us mein abhi bahut zyada chal raha hai and anti caste ban moves jo chal rahe hain usko lekar kya bataye ki seeing the situation back in india how is the south asian diaspora reacting to it दो कॉन्ट्राडिक्टरी चीजें एक साथ पॉपुलैरिटी ऑफ मोदी इज इंक्रीजिंग एंड द जो भी मार्जिनलाइजेशन एंड एट्रोसिटीज ऑन दल इज इंक्रीजिंग ऑन द अदर हैंड मणिपुर भले आप देख ले हर जगह इतनी क्लैशेज एंड एवरीथिंग इज गोइंग ऑन सो ये दो कॉन्ट्रास्टिंग चीजें एक साथ चल रही है उसको लेकर के साउथ एशियन डायस्पोरा क्या सोचती है ये आपका सवाल बहुत ही इंटरेस्टिंग है क्योंकि इस सवाल में दो चीजें हैं एक कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन जो है वो पहले से भी है द आइडिया कि इंडिया इज अ ग्रोथ स्टोरी ये हम बहुत सालों से सुन रहे हैं सिंस आई वॉज अ चाइल्ड एंड सिंस आई मूव टू द यू एस टू स्टडी दिस वॉज ऑलवेज अ स्टोरी इंडिया इज द लार्जेस्ट डेमोक्रेसी इंडिया इज अ ग्रोथ स्टोरी एंड दैट इज समथिंग दैट वी हैव टू एम्ब्रेस 
On the other hand, what we have seen is the rising authoritarianism that you are seeing. So I think in the diaspora, there is, and I think that's why, as we say, India is divided right now. The diaspora is also divided. And I want to keep reminding your viewers, your listeners, that this is something we need to remember. The diaspora is not upper caste, upper class Indians who are all in tech. The diaspora is Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Dalit, Bahujan, young, multi-generational. Yes, and that is important because young people, I am a university professor, so I work with a lot of young people, and they were mostly responsible for making caste discrimination a protected category. They are interested in the end to inequality. They understand inequality because they have experienced racism. So for that generation, Modi's appeal is less important. I think the generation, my generation, I'm 54, and the generation above me are the more who are attracted to that. So I think the contradiction that you are articulating is very much being felt here because we are being fed the growth story, India, democracy. But on the other hand, we are also seeing every day from the pandemic, before the pandemic, from the Gujarat riots, from what happened with the female wrestlers to Manipur, you take your pick. Everywhere you see, there is, uh, there, is, uh, there, is a, there is a destructive landscape unfolding. So I think people are trying to figure out how to manage this idea of the growth story of India as a bigger market. Also, the importance of India in the, in the war in Ukraine cannot be understated. Because, for example, India's refusal to take a stance has become a huge play in this in this big game of power right now in Indo-Pacific, as it is called, the region of the world that is very important. So Modi's visit is also accompanied by India's purchase of a lot of defense equipment from the United States, which will then change this power game from their dependence on Russia for equipment. So all of these things are equally important. So it's it's impossible to say why are we seeing this and not that? I think we are seeing everything. But the growth story is the one that everyone wants to talk about because that's what makes Modi's arrival reasonable. Because otherwise it will seem like a contradiction, right? We are invested in growth and, and we want to decenter China. We want to decenter other countries in the global south. So I think the messiness that you're seeing is precisely what we are experiencing here and what people in India are experiencing as well. Rich people are getting richer, poor people are getting poorer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. same the question is, yeah. I mean, I don't think there is any doubt for anybody. Even the Bhats will say, yes, we have division in India. We are a divided country. If a Bhats tells you we are united, they are lying, right? So I think this is, so the question for you and me is, when we see so much evidence around us of every single day, one Dalit Bahujan girl is raped, sexually violated, killed. We know this. So how do we live with this every day? We live with this yes. every day because we turn our head and see, um, you know, movies, landscapes of prosperity, investment and growth stories. So I think this this kind of, you know, schizophrenia, which is so proper uh, in, in India is also here in the diaspora. And as I said, the fear of being Hindu phobic is very, very strong. And I think what we are trying to do, those of us who are scholars, activists, is to remind the diaspora that Hinduism is not about division. Hinduism is about the caste system. Hinduism is about education, but it is not about the genocide of Muslims or the death of Dalits, right? So I think it's a balancing act. And again, I feel there's a lot of um, connection between what is going on in India and in the diaspora right now um, in terms of you know, what is happening electorally. 2024 is elections in India, also elections of the United States. So there is importance to this visit in many different ways. Oh, so the president wishes to appease India, to appease the Indian diaspora there perhaps? Well, I think it's I view think the large population. Yeah, I yeah. think it's more, to be honest, it is more, it's, I would say it's 100% economical. At this point in time, uh, the United States is poised in a very dangerous game of foreign policy. In order for them to reclaim their relevance in the Indo-Pacific, they need India as an ally. China continues to be a, a problem, especially with its 
you know, relationship with Taiwan escalating. So I think it's a it's a geopolitical problem right now. So I think the electoral uh, weight of Indians in the diaspora is certainly important. We have a lot of South Asian Americans who are in Congress right now who are running, but we also have a lot of South Asian Americans who are extremely conservative, like Nikki Haley, who is our version of Hindutva, right? Yeah. So, so it's it is. And, but I think the important thing um, to remember is that this is one of the few times in my lifetime that I feel like the diaspora can make a huge difference in terms of what will happen in electoral politics in India because of resources, mm -hmm. because of the global image that Modi needs to have, and because of investments, right? So I think in some ways this is, this is a moment in which that is why they are quoting the diaspora. That is why Rahul Gandhi was here. That is why Narendra Modi has come back so Too many really times true, yeah. in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and with the large number of remittance coming in 2000, that came in 2022. Yes, over and 100 for, million and counting, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Anjali, uh, there have been a long time demand for the diaspora to have the voting rights, the political mm -hmm. voting rights in India. So what mm -hmm. is the status on that? Well, I think it's 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 from what I've I've been following it quite closely. I think they want representation and it was one of the... Uh, items on the agenda that I saw that Narendra Modi was going to be discussing. I don't think it will happen, of course, on the Indian side. I think the demand will continue to be made. But I think it's also because there is two kinds of diaspora in here. There are non-resident Indians who still have Indian passports, but either have green cards or work on H-1 visas or are students. And then you have OCIs, overseas citizens of India or people of Indian origin who have American passports and don't have Indian passports, right? So I think there are two different constituencies and the NRI constituency wants the right to be able to vote from here, from if they are in the, in the diaspora in electoral um, uh, locations uh, and they're not being allowed to. And the OCI community wants representation because they feel that given how much they contribute financially through remittances and investments. So I think this is a long road, but it, it gives you a glimpse of what will happen given the, the increasing global supply chain, right? Given the increasing awareness of all of these questions. So I, I think this is not a, not a debate that will end anytime soon, but will only increase as, as we go forward. Okay, so there would be a positive step anyway in this. Uh, connection. We hope. I think it is positive in that, you know, um, the diaspora becomes uh, uh, politicized in a way that cannot be hidden anymore, right? Because the idea is that the diaspora is, you know, that is one of the arguments that conservative South Asians and Indians of the diaspora made around caste discrimination. When we come here, caste chhod ke aate hai. And, you know, that caste is not is something we do in India, not in the United States. But of course, you and I know that caste is an inherited form of thinking, of discrimination, of the division of labor. So you don't let it go just because you cross two oceans. You pass it along, you live it, you, you are part of it in many different ways. So I think for me, this is a very exciting moment, even though it is a moment of dire economic deprivation for so many of our comrades because it is people are aware people are aware people are agitated and especially young people in the diaspora i've never seen so much excitement among south asian youth and their commitment to want to engage in questions of inequality and they want to find ways to contribute uh, and to work with their comrades who are living in India. So I think this is a really, really important thing. And, and I work in South Asia myself, so I am back and forth all the time. But I see it more, um, you know, both in people of my generation who are, you know, ordinary people and people who are in universities. They are very eager to contribute and to break the cycle. And I think that's we have a Narendra positive Modi. piece of news. Yeah. yeah and I, yeah, you know what? I think Narendra Modi, because he is so unchecked right now from everything he's doing True. with the parliament house, just sub kuch jo kar rahe, wo itna Jee. zada kar rahe ki yaar log to tang a gaye. Even his Jee. own supporters, you can see the breaks in the RSS. Every day, one RSS person will say, you know, bahut ho gaya. Narendra Modi is pushing the boundary. 
so i think in some ways this will crack it, it it there is no way this can go on and i think you know we have seen that with the female wrestlers we saw that with yeah. the farmers yes exactly this yeah. all happened during the pandemic it happened after the so we are seeing a kind of refusal to back down and i think we have to take ambedkar's inspiration there and and believe that we can move forward um both in india and elsewhere along these questions aapko lagta hai ye sari jo incidents hai ye 2024 ke elections mein lok sabha elections mein kuch prabhav dalegi bjp ka asar kuch kam hoga impact popularity modi ji ki to be honest um i wish i could say yes par mujhe nahi lagta mujhe lagta hai waqt lagega aur mujhe okay. lagta hai aur 4 saal to lagenge lekin mujhe ummeed hai ki abhi jo hum dekh rahe hain to a- aapko bataya tha aapne bataya tha ki aapne rahul gandhi ki baat cheet suni so rahul gandhi for example is is nobody's hope on one hand but is everybody's hope on the other hand right he is someone that we are deeply skeptical of because of his dynastic relationship because of his lack of experience etc but the bharat jodo yatra that he did ignited a kind of landscape of possibility and i've talked to so many dalit bahujan comrades who walked with him in kerala in tamil nadu in various parts of india and came away surprised they said bhai you know we didn't think this guy was going to amount to anything but we were surprised now i'm not saying the congress is going to help us but i'm saying the fact that the bharat jodo yatra was a success and made some impact in karnataka right we had a bahujan coalition in karnataka so maybe that is the template that we move forward with rahul gandhi is not the answer but rahul gandhi may have ignited one path a debate that yeah at least at least a, a debate among the indians ki kuch to badlav hona chahiye ye ho kya raha hai ye cheez to aur provoking cheez hui hai ji acha aur badlav ko aapko to pata hai time to lagega hi to i am hopeful जी. because as i said you know um that that what the two elections that are coming up madhya pradesh and rajasthan will tell us more if this template will move forward or not but um जी. you know and and we see what is happening in maharashtra as well right with the with the bjp trying to take over and then the mess that is unfolding um so i think we will see change but it will it will take time i am not hopeful about 2024 but i am very hopeful about the next election after that okay okay that's that's a positive note you are uh, given a positive um, feeling to the indians who are uh, really disturbed about the way the regime is uh, taking steps in india okay so uh, rahul gandhi ki jab charcha chali hai aapne vistrit itni charcha ki rahul gandhi se he talked about the attacks on the constitution he talked about the unemployment about the fishermen in gujarat everything was spoken about that usme ab aapki kya views hai kya iske andar badlav hone ke liye kya opposition because i saw one question somebody asked him ki kya aap step back karenge so hmm. that some uh, strong opposition leader can take because people are still not accepting rahul gandhi unke parivarwad ki wajah se to kya aapko lagta hai other than rahul gandhi is there any other strong personality who can lead india i don't Alternative. know i don't know but what i know and i saw this in in the letter that the uh, that all the opposition parties signed when they refused to go to the opening of the parliament house it was the first time i th- saw everything from the communist party of india to yeah. uh, you know every party signed that letter right so for me that was a signal that the opposition parties understand that without some kind of coalition politics they will not be able to overthrow the bjp and i think the good thing about india is that we are a federalist uh project right so yeah. state politics do matter so i as of now i do not see a singular person but i think it might be better that we don't because at this point we need a political uh agenda platform vision and i think that's what i kept asking rahul gandhi right i think you know what i left feeling with that he's a very decent person but i was not quite sure what the political vision is you know as he kept saying nafrat ke bazar mein mohabbat ki dukan and i kept saying yaar 
बाजार और दुकान आर स्टिल मार्केट इकोनॉमी माहौल कैसे बन पहले पहले हम हमको माहौल बदलना है तो माहौल कैसे बदलते हैं माहौल बदलेंगे जब वी हैव सम काइंड ऑफ विजन प्लान दैट एवरीबडी हु इज ऑन द ऑपोजिशन कैन सी अ बाय एन राइट नाउ तो क्या कहते हैं वो रिवॉल्विंग चेयर्स हो रहा है ना वन डे वन एम एल एज विद बीजेपी अनादर वन डे विद कांग्रेस अनादर विद अनादर सो वी हैव नो पोलिटिकल स्टेबिलिटी ऑफ विजन नाउ वी नीड सम काइंड ऑफ रेवोल्यूशन ये जो छोटे छोटे स्टेप्स कुछ नहीं होने वाला है and i think that's why the bharat jodo yatra was you know a kind of nehruvian vision right which has its own problems but it was this unity and diversity you know all of the kind of discovery of india project that that my generation grew up reading about right the nehruvian vision so i think we need something like that i think the investment in personalities is not going to work and i think that's why the congress and the and and you know from mamta banerji to you know you take your pick we have been driven too much by that and my hope is that the 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 karnataka project will give people a glimpse of what they need to do and i hope rahul gandhi steps aside i hope he does not you know um is not yeah. put forward yeah keep aside his political ambitions to be a um, leader politically yeah but and i think what i liked about my conversation with him was that he seemed a better person than a politician which you know is is very rare so i think his skill is better if he works with the kinds of projects he's been working sure. on rather than um you know and then he proves his metal rather than being a gandhi you know um kind of dynasty he really connects well with the people of india he has been matlab jo humne bharat jodo yatra ke dauran dekha hai kitne apne pan se logo se milte hain so it is easier for him to connect with the people and let someone else take the political lead Yes I What agree I and think. I was yes and I was very impressed with his uh with how he was very good around questions of gender and how he was able to the entire conversation he looked at me he was very respectful and as you know that's not always the case so um but again he is not the solution he is just part of the the landscape of change that we need um we need more bahujan leaders we need more dalit leaders we need more women um and we don't have that right now we have very few uh bahujan women who are um you know who are at the helm and for now the congress for example has appointed the first dalit woman as the head of the uh, of the of the maharashtra congress which is a big step so i hope to yeah. see more of that because otherwise it's just lip service we actually need people in power who can make uh make those changes and we need to get young people involved india is a very young democracy the population veers to youth unlike the united states where we are an aging population so i think we have to be able to connect uh, to the youth figure out a platform that they are invested in and that's where as you said unemployment education environment we saw that already when um, you know with the floods in pakistan the air quality all of these things are going to be changing uh, fast so you could have all the money in the world i grew up in bombay i still i say i was born in bombay and i live in mumbai but uh, it's very even mumbai which was much cleaner than delhi is now has very high levels of pollution so people are going to die no matter how much money you have if the environment is True. not protected and i think young people understand True. that right you may be you may be a bhakt or you may be a lefty but you still have to breathe the air so how what are you going to do about it so i think you know uh, there are lots of things going on right now and we are at a, at a at a pressing point um and and mai ummeed karti hu ki aage ja ke aandolan hoga but pata nahi we'll see ji uh ek last question aur aap se puchna chahti hu anjali ji uh how do you uh, see or what are some ways in which the indian diaspora in the us can hold the indian government accountable for all these things that has been happening So there are three ways in which um the diaspora is very influential. One is its financial heft. As you said, um India receives the largest number of remittances and and I was looking at some numbers earlier on for some other interview. In 2022 the World Bank recorded that India received 100 billion dollars in in remittances. So the financial heft of the diaspora is enormous in terms of technology, industry, um most of the of the growth areas that india is very invested in 
The second um, um, area is, of course, political heft, which is to say that as we have also learned from a lot of scholarly research that we have done both here and in India, that uh, a lot of the political campaigns of Narendra Modi, the RSS, the BJP, are funded um, officially and unofficially by uh, capital that comes from the diaspora, right? So Narendra Modi's first campaign in 2014 got enormous financial help in terms of uh, particularly the Gujarati diaspora in, in the United States and, and Canada. So that is a very, very important image. And the third thing is the global supply chain. There is no way the growth story of India can work. And I'll give you a very, very simple example, which I use all the time. So about 10 years ago, the BJP, when they came into power, were very anti-same-sex um, uh, rights in any way. For a long time, the RSS and the BJP standard lines were homosexuality is a Western construct. Uske baad, when 377 was writ down and they realized that companies would not invest, public image was very important, slowly, slowly they went back and said, you heard the RSS leader saying, well, homosexuality is part of our culture. Now Ji. we are back to the same-sex marriage issue. Or abhi, Ji. they are not willing to accept, right? So I think these kinds of public image issues, because of the global representation, are going to make a difference because if the BJP comes out saying a lot of homophobic homophobic things, major companies like Apple, Disney, all of these companies that invest will stop investing. Not because they are progressive, because of capital. We are seeing that happen in the United States because uh, states that are transphobic, like Florida, Disney has taken out its investment from Florida and said you have to do better. So I think the, all of these things make a big difference because jobs are the huge growth factor in any economy and more so in India. We have a young economy. Um, and also across China, right? China's uh, sort of impact on uh, growth, jobs, and growth. Uh, Anjali, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention about the changes in the NCRT textbooks and the uh, Kishan that is going on between parties. So, uh, Karnataka, recent Karnataka changes in the re revisions in the textbooks also. So, as an academic uh, academician and as a scholar, uh, how do you view this entire episode of revisions of textbooks and taking out major lessons? I think your viewers will be surprised to hear that we have had the same problems here in the United States with the representation of Hinduism. So a lot of the BJP, uh, the BJP um, sort of, uh, Indian overseas helpers or uh, uh, what are they called? The Indian overseas uh, workers of the BJP, for example, have tried to change textbooks in, in the United States and to change their description of Hinduism to not be a, a religion that's multiple, but rather singular. So, jo aap India mein dekh rahe with the changes in the textbooks, they are being seen across the board. The Karnataka change is a positive one with the kind of uh, moving out of Veer Savarkar, etc. But you see that, for example, the Nehru Memorial Library, where I spent a lot of my time doing research, the register is going to be renamed as the Prime Minister library or something else. So we are seeing this not just in textbooks, but in the ways in which um, monuments, museums, archives in India are being socially engineered to produce a very different version of history. And I think as scholars, we are deeply concerned, right? The, the building of the Parliament House required the, the breaking down of buildings, the moving of archives, the destruction of very, very important archives. So this is not just about the future, it is about our past and what is being kept sacred and kept uh, at the center as we move forward. Gee, gee. So thank you so much, Anjali, uh, for taking out time to speak with our viewers and giving an insight into various issues that have been facing by the Indians, that have been faced by the uh, Indian diaspora there also. So. Any last message you would like to give to our viewers? No, not. I mean, I think the message I would give is the message I think Muk Nayak tries to give all the time is that we must continue to push forward. We must continue to record our descent. 
and we must continue to believe in a future that belongs to us no matter what we are seeing today around us and i think um, you know um aage badhte hain so would, but we have to always remember that these are not new struggles um and i think that's where as a historian i i take some refuge in that fact and i believe that there is uh, always going to be something bigger and better ahead of us thank you thank you so much it was a pleasure talking to you My and pleasure. we hope to see you again yes thank soon. you